Angela Harmon, thanks so much for joining me today. I just want to go right out of the gate and ask you a question about recruiting and retaining students in an orchestra program. What are some of the top things you would say as far as recruiting and retaining students? My view of recruiting is that it's not a one-time event or just a specific time of the year. For me, recruiting is something that I'm constantly doing, and it's just organically constantly happening with what I do. So my biggest recruiting strategy is how I design my curriculum and my rehearsals. Because if students stay and they know they're going to have a good experience, be successful, have fun, the students are going to talk to each other. And that is going to help with not only retention, but uh, recruiting in the long run because students talk to other students. And word of mouth is huge in a school. And then the students talk to their parents and parents talk to other parents. And pretty soon I have all of this great positive news about my program. And I'm very aware that it could happen in reverse. If I'm not careful about how I establish things and set things up, it could be negative talk about my program. And I don't want that. So I'm very um, conscious about how I approach my rehearsals and how I treat my students, build those relationships because I want the good things to be spreading all the time. Wow. You mean just give them a good product, give them a good experience. It sounds like it's front of your mind as far as serving every kid every day, almost like they're a customer. Because I'm also interested in this from like just a business standpoint, anything we do we want to retain and recruit customers or clients if we're in any kind of service business, including performing, teaching, private teachers, whatever. So you're saying that you try to make every class interesting and fun. You also are aware of your relationship with each student, making the, each of them feeling honored. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. And it actually is a big chunk of my recruiting because I, I informally ask my students in recruiting season or when a new year starts, how many of you joined orchestra just because you were already going to? You'd made that decision or you'd heard about it. And I've learned about 50% of my program, 50% of my students would have joined because of all of the things they had already heard or any other recruiting efforts have been made, which is a substantial number. And I think the longer a teacher is at a school, that number can even be increased. And I've been at my school for two years. So I think 50% of my students is, that are already going to come to me based on what they know is great. And then the other 50% I get from doing a show. How often do you survey your students and what questions do you put in the survey? I just informally ask them in class, raise your hand if you join my orchestra because of the recruiting show you remember me doing. Or how many of you remember when I went to the show? What do you remember about my recruiting show? So I can see what's connecting the most for them when I go play for them. And I always ask them, how many of you joined because of that show? How many of you would have joined regardless? Wow. Okay. And half of them joined because of word of mouth. What's a recruiting show? How does that work? Who do you do it for? So there are six elementary schools that feed into the school where I teach. I take all of my second year students to each of those schools and we have it down to a science i call it a tour like it's well, as if we're going on tour like it's a big thing and it takes two days we go we set up we perform for about 25 minutes and then we hurry and pack up and then we go to the next school and do it all again it really does feel like a professional tour for them because they do the same thing over and over and we put on a show and we have costumes and props and it's very high energy fun. I keep them hyped up on pixie sticks. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> they have a great time. That's so proactive. It makes a lot of sense. Do most people do that? Or around no? Yeah, around here, most people will go do a visit to the feeder school. And I think that's common. But my issue with that is there are too many visits that are boring for that lack of excitement. Right. So I'm very careful about how I structure my show. Yeah. capture their interest, keep it exciting. That's the important thing. Do you give a specific call to action to people there, like join orchestra or here's the next step you can take? How do you get them to take a next step immediately so that it connects to the following year that they join orchestra? Yeah, I've desi I designed brochures and flyers that they have to fill out, an interest form they need to fill out. And I tell them to get to my program, I have to have that form back because my program fills up. Because it does, my program is maxed out. 
Wow. So I say, if you really want to get in, I need that form back. And I get lots of those back months. The fact that your program is maxed out speaks volumes. I've witnessed your relationship with your students, your work ethic, and your innovation, which everybody can find going to Instagram or Facebook to see Angela's daily inspiration, orchestra teacher life on Instagram. Her Facebook page is orchestraclassroom.com or go to orchestraclassroom.com if you want to reach Angela. I could talk about how impressed I am and try to describe <laughs> you as a teacher, but I think the facts speak louder, actually. The fact that your program is maxed out, especially given that it's a new program because you were at another program, but then you started a whole new program and you build it up in a very short amount of time. So those facts speak volumes. To review real quick, the way that you recruit is you focus on keeping them engaged and giving them a great class, keeping them active. And then you do these shows, which are like sales pitches, and you really follow through visiting every feeder program, six elementary schools, dressing up, making it a whole thing and making a sales pitch and then giving brochures and telling people to take the next step. Did I miss anything? Like that's it. Yeah. yeah. The third prong to my recruiting process is how I do my concerts. Because people come to my concerts. Again, I want news to be spreading about my program as much as possible. Hopefully all good news. So when parents go to my performances and they see a successful, like amazing result, or they're very entertained, that's huge for me. I get so many emails from grandmas that was like, I usually bring earplugs to my concerts, <laughs> my kids' concerts, but I didn't have to bring one to yours. Over delivering on what that concert experience is going to be, even if it's just a little middle school orchestra. That's big advertising for me. I don't want this to be taken the wrong way, but my perception is that of a lot of orchestra classroom teachers are just trying to survive. Hand in hand with that is the mentality that orchestra is an elective, a class where you don't have to work. But there's lots of teachers that I think are just trying to get by. Like, I just need to get through a day without catching a lawsuit. But you clearly are all in with, no, they're going to play music and they're going to enjoy it. They're going to work. What are your thoughts about that? That's what's fun for me. This is what I chose for my job and my profession. And I have this passion for it. And of course, it's not fun for me if I'm going to work every day. You're not progressing. Or they just sound terrible, which can happen for some stretches of time. But it's always my goal to be working on that and seeing the growth because that's motivating to me. But it's also motivating to students. You can see that growth. Um, and, and that's I feel like that's where it all comes from. I have to have that growth and see progress in my students. And I have to have fun myself. And then I can project that with my students. If I'm having fun, they're going to have fun as well. You start students in seventh grade, their first year playing the instruments, right? They start in sixth grade, first year. Sorry, but you're starting them and then you've got them six, seven, and eight usually? Our school's just sixth and seventh grade, so I only have them for two years. Right. Yeah, I got to work with six and seven at your school. I was amazed with how engaged the students were, how much they could already play into just their first year. That's really cool. What are the kinds of challenges that you incur like with motivating students and keeping them enthusiastic or retaining them? Uh, with retaining them, I guess the hardest thing was retention. I feel like it doesn't always come back to me or my program. Just schools have a lot of decisions, administrators are making decisions about electives. So I feel like nationwide, that's a huge issue for any arts class. When principals or admins start cutting how many elective students get, that's a challenge. And I left my previous job for that reason. I knew the way that electors were run would affect my program. So that's a big issue as far as retention. Getting my students to stay, uh, as far as just enjoying my class, I, that comes to, that's all on me. I feel, at least me, I feel like I'm the CEO of my program. And if all of a sudden a bunch of kids drop, then that's on me. I'm very self-reflective that way. So if anything negative is happening that I'm seeing in my students or things that I don't like, or if I, my retention rate isn't what I want it to be, then I'm, I go back to myself and think, what am I doing that causing this? And what, in what ways do I need to change? 
or what strategies do I need to implement to make things better? Yeah, I can only imagine that there are situations where it has nothing to do with you, right? There must be a student here and there who's leaving for some reason that's totally outside of your control. Students are all different. They develop differently. But I can appreciate that you're making yourself responsible for everything as a starting point. What would you say to other teachers as far as where's the biggest source of information or strategy for you as a teacher when it comes to you getting better, being a better leader, being better at enrolling, at relating, engaging kids? What domain do you go to? Is it like leadership? Is it productivity? Is it personal development? For me, professionally, any time that I am learning, it makes me better. I find that any time I pick up a book and I read it, it's making me better. And it doesn't always have to be a book about music education. I just barely was reading a book about teachers that make the biggest difference. Um, and that affects me. And I read it and I get ideas and things that I want to implement in my classroom or maybe personal habits I have that I want to work on and change. So anytime we are educating ourselves in any sphere, it could maybe I read a book about leadership or one just about education, or maybe I, I work with you on learning creative approaches. All of those things are making me a better teacher. What was that book called? Teachers That Make a Difference? I think that's what it was called. I just, cool. on my nightstand right now, I'd have to, I think it's called Teachers That Make a Difference. I love that. And just to reiterate for anybody here, I was thinking about what questions that I could ask you, but I know that you share so many tips that can make orchestra teachers' life easier, quicker, faster on your Instagram, on your Facebook, at orchestraclassroom.com. You even have a shop at Teachers Pay Teachers. So just want to encourage people to go find them. But I wonder if you could share a couple recent things that you've discovered or implemented into your curriculum or workflow that have been effective. I've been working on how to track my students better because my classes are huge. And it's really hard to keep track of what each individual student needs in a large class because a lot of them don't have private lessons. It's just hard for me to keep track and keep them progressing. So I really worked this summer about how to implement a way where students can be assessing themselves and I could check in with them more often. So I've been designing some different types of files using Google Sheets and Google Forms where I can be connecting with students more often and checking in with them more often. But because they're going to have stand partners help them assess each other, it's not going to be overburdensome for me because I have to be careful to not burn out on what I'm doing, be careful with my time. And so I'm much more selective now about how I run things and what new things I'm going to implement because I, I want it to work and I want to burn out. <laughs> That's beautiful. I'm guessing that you have some systems that you're probably sharing with other teachers. Yeah, I've started posting some of those ideas on my blog, which is orgsforteacher.blogspot.com. And I'm excited to be implementing those things. I just think it's big for students to be able to, to know where they stand by doing these little activities. They're going to know what I expect to know where they stand and know what they need to do to improve. So I think it'll be, it'll help them a lot. It does seem like you have a lot of systems. <clears throat> Can I share a system with you? Sure. And this is something that another full-time orchestra teacher, Austin Shelzo, adapted based on my recommendation. I heard about the effect that it had, and I'm curious if you're going to like it. Austin retired from his orchestra teaching job, and he became a full-time entrepreneur freelancer. He's performing and teaching privately, but he was teaching in middle school orchestra in Connecticut for many years. Austin Shelzo, it looks like Skelzo, it's S-C-E-L-Z-O, if anybody wants to look him up. And he's a great at teaching bluegrass. If anybody wants to listen back for that, just look for Creative Strings Podcast and look for Austin Shelzo, the episode with him. But anyway, this is the big game changer that I shared with him, like you were saying, to kind of automate and personalize at the same time. So it's email sequences, email autoresponders. I have about 10,000 people on my email subscribed to my email newsletter. And when anybody enters into my newsletter or most people, when they enter in my newsletter, 
they get 15 emails from me over the first two months. Those have all been programmed as an autoresponder. And they're personalized and set up to match with the reason the person's there. And there's also a sequence involved in onboarding and nurturing and giving them frequently asked questions, answers to those things. So anyway, Austin, at my recommendation, he did this with his school, with his classrooms, and it really helped him. So you know the things that you're going to do for the first three months or six months. Those lessons can be programmed into emails ahead of the school year. You can change them, but you can also have a series of emails that are just for parents that teaches the parents how to be supportive. And you can also have things for the students. Have you ever heard about that or thought about trying that kind of approach? I haven't tried it yet. I could see it saving a ton of time. The hard thing for a teacher is being organized enough to set it up. The hardest part. Well, obviously you create curriculum, lesson notes, assignments, and all this stuff, right? As you're doing that this year, you can just be saving each of these emails into, I'm sure you have a lot of these things already saved from past years, right? So all you're doing is copying and pasting some of those into emails. And probably there's tech at the school that can help you set it up if you don't have a separate email autoresponder. Or you could just have like literally Google Doc, which is like email one, email two, email three, and then you could just send them manually and just push CC on everybody or whatever. I think the point is that you're doing that work anyway. So if this year, if you do it in real time, you could just save it each time and you'll have it for years into the future. But for example, with my son goes to a school, it's a small private school and that school sends the parents like a lot of emails which is a great way for them to communicate with us. We're not supposed to write back to everything. It's just like they're keeping us in the loop. I think it's great for retention. It's great for recruitment. It's, it helps motivate. Actually, marketing and teaching are very similar in this way, right? Because as you know, if you're posting on Instagram, on your blog, people are seeing that. They're taking action. They're getting inspired because they're seeing your tips every day. It's just like the kids, you know? So if you're sending them email... On top of everything else, you're sending emails to their parents on top of seeing every class. It's just going to add more and more reminders and formats and contextuality. So anyway, Austin loves it. I love it. I've been doing email marketing for years, but really it's teaching. I think that's one of the things we learned from the pandemic is how much we can do virtually to reinforce and inspire and motivate people and educate them. So I agree. I sometimes get emails from parents that say, hey, what's my student supposed to be working on or where are they supposed to be practicing this week? So I think that could be a really good way to say, hey, this week, here's what kids will be practicing. And then I have parents maybe on board because I don't grade on practicing. I don't like them when they show up to parent teacher conference and they ask me, should my kid be practicing? <laughs> Which I've gotten in the past. <laughs> yeah, I think that can actually be a good strategy for that. One of the last pieces I wanted to ask you about is the kind of the creative side of things, improvisation, eclectic styles, learning harmony. Obviously, a lot of traditional orchestra class is just learning orchestra skills, which are reading music and playing an instrument and playing in tune, playing in rhythm, very technical. I'm curious what you think about how orchestra teachers can incorporate other types of music, musical skills, other types of musicianship related to composition, arranging, harmony, groove, improvisation, et cetera. Yeah, I came and worked with my students for a while. One thing I noticed immediately was how many students who were not my top students, but who were so involved and engaged. And I realized that we need that creativity side if I'm really going to reach all of my students. And not only that, it's going to make my top players better. And it's also going to help bring along those lower level players, make them feel successful. There's so many ways that I thought to use the creativity in my classroom. Uh, one way is to just build some of their skills. Like I know my students were had a real weakness sometimes for just keeping in, <laughs> maintaining a steady pulse. And I thought if I start doing some of these creative things, not just tied to notes, I, I knew they would build that skill. So I'm excited to try a lot of these things with them. Um, throughout the school year. But also, I just think stu students need that creativity and expression. If if I want them to love music and love playing their instruments, what better way than to have them have some ownership and to create things on their own? 
I think once they they have the confidence to do that and just have that experience, then of course they're going to connect more with music. And I love what they're doing. Love what they're learning. For many years, I've heard a version from many classical teachers, something to the effect of kids need to learn technique first. First, they need to learn proper technique. We need to teach them proper technique. After that, then they can learn to be creative. What's your take on that? I think s students are, especially kids, they are creative already. Why would we squelch that and <laughs> wait for later? Then they could be trying it. And it, it comes so naturally to them. Oh, I feel like they're, it would be a shame to be asking students to hold that back when they're so naturally want to explore and create and, and it's fun. So I think that they should be allowed to have that creativity and exploration as part of their learning. Teachers also talk about feeling pressured by the need to teach towards the concert and or towards the adjudication or contest or whatever. And therefore that doing creative things gets relegated or pushed aside, or we'll just do one week on it, but otherwise we need to focus all our attention. Do you have any thoughts on how to reconcile that? I think there are creative things you could implement in warmups every single day. I think warmups should be creative every single day. They shouldn't be the same thing every, how boring would that be if it was the same D scale every single day? Right. I mean, it would, it's so simple to add that creativity as part of a, a warmup. There's no reason why it can't be a daily, yeah. daily thing to build those skills. Yeah. Yeah. I work at a lot of schools. But when I came and worked at your school, I felt really gratified because you expressed that you were interested in implementing things that I was doing related to improvisation. And of course, I, for many years, I've been trying to knock that door down. And so I want to tell listeners that Angela and I co-created a mini course for orchestra teachers. It's great for first and second year players. We co-created a mini course. So if you're interested in diversifying your curriculum, you can check it out. You can get it at orchestraclassroom.com. Just go to orchestraclassroom.com. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Angela there or reach out to me. It's very accessible, super affordable mini course. It'll give you at least enough material to work with your students for a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. I have one other thing that I wanted to ask you about. You did a bachelor's in music ed, right? I have a bachelor's degree in music education, K through 12. Gotcha. Instrumental. Right. And then you've taught in the K through 12 schools for how long? Is that okay to ask? I've taught for about 15 years, well, plus a few before school ones that didn't count on my pay scale. So technically like 18. Wow. And I got Suzuki certified as well. So wow. I did that training. I used to have a Suzuki studio. Um, so I, I have five children at home. So I had a 10 year break from public teaching public school. And during that 10 year break, I had a Suzuki studio. So that's really like 28 years of teaching. I am yeah, old. <laughs> I didn't mean it that way. I just meant there's a big difference between 18 <laughs> years and 28 years. Cause it's like you, you've been teaching in schools for 18 years, but you also taught private studio for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of stuff a long time. You've told me that you think highly of the Suzuki method. I feel like there's a lot of misunderstanding obviously i'm a suzuki grad i'm a suzuki dad twice and so i'm a big fan i guess m the way i think about suzuki when i talk to other people who are like suzuki this suzuki that 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 haven't been a part of the culture is that it's a very diverse uh community of teachers who just like any community of teachers, most of the teachers that, that I meet come from a place of love and they care about their students and they have, they might have different ideas about how to get results, but there's a couple core principles within Suzuki that I think everybody agrees with, but yeah. the rest of it is just like people caring about students and trying to do a good job and trying to be better teachers. What do you say to people when they're like Suzuki this or Suzuki that? What would you say to educate them? I study what Suzuki method really is, and especially the philosophy behind it. I remember when I was a new mom, I had read the book from zero to, from, I can't remember the title of it now, birth to, I wish I remember the name of it. I just remember it. I think it was a book by Suzuki 
And it just changed the way I felt about raising my children, about talent, where talent is, how to develop talent and the gifts that each person is inherently capable of if it's nurtured. Um, and I think that's what the Suzuki program is really about. It's about nurturing talent that's already there, but de- developing those skills in, uh, in a way that's um, laid out systematically that build skills and confidence. And there, there's just a lot I like about the method. I think that it gets a bad name for us sometimes for note reading or everything being played the same way, but I think that it's evolved and it's not all like that anymore. I still think it's a great way to, for young kids to learn. Yeah. Was the book Nurtured by Love? It, it was not that one. It was Ability Development from Birth. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. I, I think that's what it was called. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you. Some teachers that teach Suzuki will encourage sight reading, right? Some teachers that do Suzuki might encourage fiddle playing, theory, or chamber music, or there's all kinds of ways to modify the specifics. Last question. So I know that you had a training in music education, and I did not. I was trained as a performer and then had a performing career for a long time before I even started my journey as a teacher. And I worked on that for about the last 20 years. But it was mainly like just figuring it out and just doing it and then asking teachers that I met, such as yourself, for feedback, like everywhere I go. And and I went to so many orchestra classrooms and worked with a lot of Suzuki teachers and group classes and stuff. And I would just ask for feedback. I was like, what can I do better? What did I do wrong? No, really tell me you're a teacher. I'm asking for your advice. And I got different feedback over the years, which has been really helpful. But one of those times I asked a math teacher or an English teacher in Norway, and he organized this program for me to visit a ton of music schools in Norway. I stayed at his family's house and I asked him one day, I was like, what is it that, that makes a good teacher? And he said, there's three things. He said, number one, come from a place of love. Number two, come to every student at their level. And number three, just be a step or two ahead of them with whatever they need to learn. Is there anything you would add or, or say differently about, you know, what it is in your mind that makes a good teacher or why you like teaching? Um, I like teaching because, like I said before, I'd love to see that growth and that progress in students. And I have fun when I teach. I feel like it's my alternate personality. <laughs> I love two different people. There's the whole me and there's the teacher me. And I just, I love motivating and inspiring students to be their best and progress. That that makes me happy. As far as being a good teacher, I guess always knowing, having an idea of how you're going to fix things. And then if you don't know, being willing to go work on it and come back with the strategy. I never would leave a rehearsal and just be like, I guess they're not going to get that. Um, always th- trying to think and problem solve. So being really reflective uh, on what you're doing and where you're going with your students and in the problem solving and, and the creative work at home to, to keep that momentum, I think is a big part of teaching. Wow. That's beautiful. Thank you. First of all, for everybody out there, like connect with Angela Harmon, go to on Instagram, orchestra.teacher.life, go to orchestraclassroom.com on Facebook or just the website, go to orchestra teacher dot blogspot dot com for her blog and reach out to her she's really helpful bring her into your conferences to present because i know that she presents on so many things beyond the topics we covered today like just really a very diverse array of specific topics all of which you can see if you just like peek at her instagram like you'll see just like just constant stuff productivity curriculum pedagogy leadership, just so many things. Thanks for being an inspiration to me. Thanks for being open to my improv ideas and uh, giving me a shot to come work with your students. And I'm looking forward to us collaborating on more things. Anything you want to leave people with? Oh, just thank you. I'm learning a ton from seeing what you do. And I'm super excited. One thing that when a new school year starts, it's just fun to have something new to start working and trying with students. So I'm just really excited to dive into it and see how it goes. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. All right. Thanks again, Angela.